Hines, Associate General Counsel at HireRight, and this is Navigating Compliance, the second webinar in our 2023 quarterly series and our mid-year update. While I'm a lawyer, today's webinar is not intended as legal or compliance advice. My intentions are to give you information that you'll take as talking points to raise with your teams and with your legal counsel. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. During this webinar, please take the conversation to Twitter using the hashtag HireRightWebinar. In order to receive HRCI or SHRM credit, you must attend the full live session of this webinar. Credit information will be emailed a few days after today's presentation. We're not providing copies of today's slides. However, we will send you an email with a link to a recording of this webinar session. If you're experiencing any audio or video issues, please refresh the browser window by clicking F5 on your keyboard or send us a message using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Sharon is producing today's webinar and will be monitoring the feed for any technical issues. After the presentation, we'd really appreciate getting your feedback. So take our brief survey and let us know if the session was helpful. My focus is to create sessions that are meaningful, so I welcome ideas for future topics. So again, take 60 seconds out of your day and let us know what you think. And again, press F5 on your keyboard to refresh this presentation anytime you experience any audio or video problems. Throughout 2023, I've been characterizing the legislation introduced the session as bills that, that do more with less. I, I mentioned this last quarter, and it's held true as we start to see legislatures adjourn for the year. In fact, uh, there are only eight states still in session. So what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing a trend away from legislation that we've seen over the last seven years or so. Instead, we've seen lawmakers advance legislation that has a broad impact and generally supports workers' rights at the expense of additional compliance obligations for you, for employers. And that's exactly what we're gonna cover today. Like I mentioned, we're seeing a trend towards clean slate laws that seal or expunge criminal records, replacing ban the box laws. Although we'll cover one ban the box update later today, we're gonna talk about pay transparency. This is sharing salaries, replacing general pay equity laws, and of course, more legalization in the marijuana space. So there is today's rundown on the screen. I'll provide a overview of the current state of the law and a snapshot of legislation that we're monitoring. And most importantly, I'll offer some practical guidance at the end of each section to comply or prepare to comply with those particular laws. As always, we have a lot of ground to cover today and I try and keep a quick pace through these topics. So please do not consider this to be a comprehensive discussion, but it should provide you with a good overview. And as always, I'm looking for new opportunities to create content that's beneficial to you. So when you fill out the survey, let me know if you'd like me to discuss what you'd like me to focus on or discuss in the future. Um, so as always, just settle in for the next hour. And remember, if you have any questions during this webinar, use the Q&A icon and I'll try and cover those at the end. Okay, we're gonna kick things off today with a broad discussion concerning criminal history reform. And here's a look at clean slate laws across the United States. As I mentioned in the rundown, clean slate laws expunge or seal certain criminal records from public access once somebody remains crime-free for a period of time. And we're seeing a trend towards adopting clean slate laws. It seems that Instead of just restricting an employer's ability to ask a candidate about their criminal history, lawmakers are simply sealing or expunging criminal history so that it's not available to employers. The goal of clean slate laws is to remove the stigma associated with criminal history so that individuals who have offended have an easier time of getting a job. And as you can see on the screen, Every state except for Wisconsin offers some form of post-conviction expungement or sealing of qualifying criminal offenses to varying degrees. In case you're wondering, if you're over the age of 25 and were convicted of a crime in Wisconsin, you're gonna need to petition the governor for a pardon for post-conviction relief. But that conviction still stays on your record. Your pardon, but the record is still there. And in the rest of the United States, you'll see varying degrees of criminal history relief available. The states in red offer the broadest levels of relief. Most nonviolent felony and misdemeanor convictions can be wiped clean. 
while those in the uh, orange or terracotta color are most restrictive. They only permit sealing or expunging of specific offenses as directed by that particular state's statute. So again, the takeaway is that in most states, there's some form of post-conviction relief that wipes a non-violent criminal record clean so that qualifying offenses no longer appear in a court's record. And if they no longer appear in a court's record, as a result, they're not gonna be reported in a criminal background check. And I've created this map to show you the states that offer automatic relief to ex-offenders. This means that qualifying offenses are automatically expunged or sealed from a court's records. And you can see the types of offenses available for automatic relief in the legend to the map. Uh, those states in red offer the broadest types of crimes available for autom automatic relief, generally all nonviolent convictions and non-convictions, and those in that terracotta or orange color being the most restrictive, generally non-convictions only. And in the gray states, an individual needs to petition the court to have any qualifying criminal history sealed or expunged. It's not automatic in those gray states. Here is an overview of clean slate laws that were passed or will become effective in 2023. I've listed these in chronological order of effective date for you, starting with Connecticut. So Connecticut's law became effective at the start of the year and was supposed to provide broad automatic expungement of most nonviolent felonies and misdemeanors. But the state has had some problems identifying and expunging eligible offenses. Uh, so as of now, uh, only cannabis offenses are automatically expunged. So unfortunately for individuals with criminal history that's eligible for this automatic expungement, their criminal records are gonna continue to be available in the court systems and will continue to be reported to you until the state can kind of get their act together and really process those expungements. Looking at Utah, Utah, DC, and Arizona, they all have petition-based processes for expungement. California, California leads the country in criminal history reform by extending automatic relief to felony level offenses after only four years. Only four years, a felony level offense is wiped clean. It's a really short period of time comparatively to other states. In California, automatic expungement becomes available for most defendants convicted of most nonviolent felonies. And even those convicted of violent or other serious offenses, they can petition the court for expungement. It is by far the most generous clean slate law for ex-offenders. Idaho, Idaho also permits uh, petition-based sealing of relatively minor nonviolent non-sexual offenses. And Virginia amended its law to provide for automatic relief for dismissed cases and some misdemeanors and allow for petition-based sealing for several misdemeanor and felony convictions. And here's a new one. In the second quarter, New York expanded its clean slate law. The existing clean slate law in New York permits criminal records to be sealed through a judicial review process, a petition-based process. The new legislation, that's uh, Assembly Bill 1029C, it automatically seals eligible cases, so there's no need to petition for expungement. Misdemeanor offenses are automatically sealed three years after the term of the sentence. Eligible felony convictions are sealed eight years after the duration of the sentence. Class A felonies and convictions requiring registration as a sex offender are ineligible for automatic sealing. Again, once sealed, those records are unavailable to most employers. They're not reported, uh, they're not eligible to be found, they're not reported on a background check. This bill, 1029C, is awaiting Governor Hochul's signature. It's expected she's gonna sign it. And once signed, it'll become effective one year later. And I'll of course continue to monitor this and provide you with an update if and when it becomes law. Like I mentioned at the top of the call, while there's been a lot of movement with sealing and expunging criminal history through clean slate laws, there's been very few developments in the ban the box arena. But I do have one update for you, which we're gonna cover shortly. But first, here is a look at the landscape of ban the box jurisdictions impacting private employers at the state and local levels. Again, private employers, public employers are subject to many more ban the box jurisdictions. But as it relates to private employers, in all 39 of the jurisdictions on the screen, you can't ask the, have you ever been convicted of a crime question until some later time in the hiring process? 
in the 19 jurisdictions that you see in that red text, the ban the box measure applies to any form of work for monetary gain. So if you pay somebody to do a job, then they're subject to the ban the box measure. So this would include not only your traditional employees, but also contractors. There's often a, a uh, mistaken belief that contractors are not subject to ban the box measures. They are, especially in those in the red text. If you've attended my other webinars, you know that I always say not all the ban the box laws are created equal. Not all ban the box laws are created equal. In all ban the box jurisdictions, you, you generally can't ask a candidate if they've ever been convicted of a crime during that initial application or request a criminal background check before a conditional offer. Those are the jurisdictions that you see in that gray standard box. But then there are also some jurisdictions that require special handling. On your screen, you're gonna see those in that aqua column that require that you identify the criminal conduct that may disqualify a candidate from hire and provide them with a notice as part of the pre-adverse action process. Then there are those in that blue column that require that you conduct and provide an individualized assessment that relates the candidate's criminal conduct to the job to which they've applied as part of that pre-adverse action process. And then you have Los Angeles and New York City shown in the wine or purple colored column on your screen. In those two jurisdictions, Los Angeles and New York City, you also need to provide additional city provided notices or substantially similar forms as part of that pre-adverse action process. And then to complicate things even further, there are four jurisdictions, Louisiana, New York State, Atlanta, Georgia, and Gainesville, Florida, that don't specifically ban the box, but they do require that you, that employers, conduct an individualized assessment. Again, an individualized assessment is your analysis of the candidate's criminal history with its potential relationship to the position for which the candidate is under consideration. While you have to perform that analysis, you don't necessarily need to provide it to the candidate. I'm always asked about the individualized assessment process. The EEOC's 2012 guidance to employers concerning the use of arrest and conviction records, it's a really good read that can help you understand the individualized assessment process if you're not familiar with it. Um, if you're not familiar with the EEOC's 2012 guidance, we've linked to it in the resources section of this webinar. So check it out. It's an incredibly helpful piece of guidance. As you can see on the screen, you can't adopt this one size fits all model for compliance. You're gonna have to modify your adjudication and pre-adverse and adverse action practices to align with a particular jurisdiction's law. So with that said, just a quick reminder that you can use Higher Rights Compliance Workbench Solution to manage your band the box obligations. The solution is made available for free, again, no cost to you. So let us know if you want more information when you fill out the survey. Just a quick plug, we read recently published and is available at our resource library. And if you're a higher right customer, you'll also find our sample pre-adverse and adverse action templates for your reference in Compliance Central. You can find Compliance Central within Screening Manager. And here is our only ban the box update this quarter. And, and really, I think for the last 18 months or so, and that's Chicago's amended ban the box ordinance. So let's focus on what's changed. First, the ordinance applies to any employer of any size with an office or facility in Chicago or who's required to hold a business license to operate in Chicago. For what it's worth, that's basically any business operating in the city. Previously, the ordinance only applied to those organizations that employed 15 or more workers. Chicago's ordinance also limits an employer's ability to adversely impact an individual who has a criminal history unless that conviction bears a substantial relationship to the position sought or the employer believes that an individual poses an unreasonable risk to safety. So this means that you're going to need to conduct an individualized assessment that looks at the length of time since the conviction, the number of convictions that appear, appear on the conviction record, the nature and severity of the conviction, its relationship to the safety and security of others, and any other facts or circumstances surrounding that conviction, as well as the age of the employee at the time of the conviction, and then any evidence of rehabilitation efforts. That's all as part of the individualized assessment process. There are also changes to the pre-adverse and adverse action processes. As part of the pre-adverse process, you're going to need to include your reasoning as to why the candidate's criminal history may disqualify them for hire. So effectively, the outcome of that individualized assessment. You'll also need to advise the candidate that they have at least 
five days to submit any evidence of rehabilitation to you. And the adverse action notice needs to include the reason behind your decision not to hire the candidate. So you're going to probably want to include that individualized assessment again. You'll also need to include the candidate's right to file a complaint with the Chicago Commission on Human Relations, as well as any mechanism to challenge your decision. So that's how do they get in touch with you to challenge that particular discussion or decision. So this is obviously very different from your standard pre-adverse and adverse action letters. If you're a higher right client, our sample templates have been updated for your reference. You can find those in Compliance Central. And again, you'll need to manage your compliance obligations, these specific Chicago pre-adverse and adverse action requirements, either within Compliance Workbench or outside of our platform. So please let us know in the survey if you have any questions or interest in our free Compliance Workbench solution that can help you manage your compliance obligations with Chicago's Ban the Box Law. And quickly, I want to provide you with an update on legislation that we were monitoring in California, starting with SB 647. You might remember that a California court decision resulted in the redaction of dates of birth from public record searches. That means that criminal records couldn't easily be matched with an individual. SB 647 was introduced in this legislative session to create a mechanism by which access to personal identifiers would have been restored under certain circumstances. Unfortunately, that bill was not heard by the Senate in time for a vote, so it's going to be reconsidered in next year's legislative session, in the 23-24 legislative session. The same is true for SB 809. SB 809 would eliminate the ability of most private employers to conduct criminal background checks. Again, huge, right? No criminal background checks for most private employers. This bill, SB 809, also didn't progress in time for a vote, but it will be reconsidered next year. So if your business has been negatively impacted by the date of birth redaction issue or would be negatively impacted by the inability to conduct criminal background checks, it's important that lawmakers hear your story. As you complete the survey following today's webinar, please let us know if you'd like us to share your story or if you'd like to share your story directly with the Professional Background Screening Association. This is our industry association, and we're happy to put you in touch with them. We want to make sure that your voice is heard. It's really important to the PBSA. I've also linked to information from the PBSA regarding these issues in California within the resources section of this webinar. So check out the PBSA's information within that link. And just a quick note, uh, this isn't specifically relevant to criminal screening, but it applies to all background checks conducted by a third party consumer reporting agency such as HireRight. A revised Fair Credit Reporting Act or FCRA summary of rights has been issued by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFBP. This is the regulator for the FCRA. The changes the CFBP made are minimal. They basically updated contact information for a variety of federal agencies. As a reminder, employers need to provide the FCRA summary of rights along with a copy of the background report as part of the pre-adverse action process. This is the process that you follow when you disqualify an individual from hire or affect a worker's employment based in whole or in part on the results of the background check. So the new FCRA summary of rights must be in place by March 20th of 2024. At higher rate, we've already implemented the revised form on our platform, so it's already in there. But if you manage the pre-adverse uh, and or adverse action processes outside of our platform, outside of higher rate, please ensure that you update your processes to include the new document by March of 2024. So here's our recap. As always, I try and bring you some actionable guidance as we navigate the compliance landscape. As a reminder, if you ask candidates to self-disclose their criminal history, you should periodically review your questions and any state or local instructions or notices that you provide to your candidates to maintain compliance with state uh, clean slate laws or ban the box laws. It's your sole responsibility as employers to ensure that these notices and questions are compliant and relevant for your screening program. Just a general reminder to make sure that you're familiar with and that you've established processes to comply with the specialized notices and assessments that are required in Ban the Box jurisdictions. Remember that you can't use your standard pre-adverse and adverse action letters for Chicago candidates. You're going to need to ensure that they're tailored specifically to the amended Ban the Box ordinances requirements. Again, if you're a higher right client, you can manage these processes in Compliance Workbench or outside of our platform if you prefer. 
but you can't take a one size fits all approach to ban the box compliance. Things in California are, are still a mess and your support is needed. So let us know if you'd like to, to get involved. And the FCRA summary of rights was revised. It's updated on the high right platform, but if you don't use our platform, then you'll need to update your processes to incorporate the new FCRA summary of rights by March 20th of 2024. A lot of information here. So as we close out this session, I want to remind you to get your questions in using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. We'll get to those towards the end of this webinar. OK, let's shift gears and talk about pay equity measures. Remember that pay equity measures look to promote equal pay for equal work and will often include a ban on asking a candidate about their former compensation until some later point in the hiring process. And pay transparency measures require that you share a pay range with candidates and in some cases with employees as well. Here is a map I've created to show you the jurisdictions that require that you either post or provide a salary range for any open positions. The concept of pay transparency, it's exactly that. It requires that employers are open about how they intend to pay their employees. Most pay transparency laws note that the range that you publish is what that you reasonably intend to pay that worker. So what we've seen is a lot of employers be chastised in the media and online by posting these huge pay ranges that lack, specific, that lack specificity. Ideally, you should avoid this. Instead, what you should do is conduct a pay analysis by role and determine the minimum and maximum ranges that you reasonably expect to pay for those particular roles and share those pay ranges with any job posts or advertisements. That's, that's what you wanna go for, these more specific pay ranges and not broad pay ranges. Here are two new jurisdictions that require pay transparency, Hawaii and Illinois. You'll see that Hawaii's measure only impacts employers with 50 or more employees and only applies to new hires, not to existing employees. On the other hand, in Illinois, employers with 15 or more employees need to disclose the pay scale and a general description of benefits in job postings. There are also pay transparency requirements for internal positions in Illinois, and employers will have to announce any promotional opportunities to current employees no later than 14 calendar days after the employer advertises the job to prospective external candidates. Colorado has led the nation when it comes to pay transparency. Colorado was the first jurisdiction to enact a pay transparency law back in 2021, and this year it clarified and expanded that pay transparency's law. So. You'll remember that I just told you about the requirement in Illinois to notify employees about promotional opportunities. Well, Colorado expands on this concept to include notification requirements for, for any job opportunities, including promotional opportunities that your existing workforce may want to consider. Again, any job opportunities that your existing workforce may want to consider. So realistically, that's probably most of your job advertisements. And you'll see those notice requirements on the screen. As part of the pre-hire process, the notification to your existing employees needs to include a wage and salary range and a general description of benefits and any other compensation. It should also tell your workers the date that the application window for the job opportunity is expected to close. When are you going to stop accepting applications? You'll have to include that in your notice. And then as part of the post-hire notice, within 30 days of selecting a candidate for a job opportunity, you'll need to notify the colleagues of the person that you selected for the job of the person's name, their former job title, but only if they were hired from within the company. If they're external, you can exclude this. Their new job title and information concerning how your employees can express interest in similar opportunities in the future. So a statement like visit our job board to learn more about similar job opportunities or contact HR to learn about new job opportunities. Something like that needs to be included and made available to your existing employees. There is an exception for employers not physically located in Colorado and with fewer than 15 employees working remotely in Colorado but all other employers must follow the pre and post hire notice requirements for all job opportunities that an internal candidate is eligible to apply for. 
So that is Colorado's very nuanced pay transparency law. Again, the most expansive in the nation. And really quickly, staying in Colorado, this isn't related to pay equity or transparency, but it does impact your application process. Colorado has passed a law that prohibits you from collecting any information related to age, date of birth, or dates of attendance or at or graduation from an educational institution on initial employment applications. Again, this is only relevant to initial employment applications. This information can be collected later in the hiring life cycle, for example, when you request a background check. For what it's worth, California, Connecticut, Minnesota, and Pennsylvania, they also have laws restricting age-related information in initial employment applications. Colorado now joins them. And here's a map I've created that shows you the jurisdictions that prohibit you from asking a job applicant or candidate about their salary history. There are now 27 cities, counties, or states that have enacted salary history maps. And while you can't ask about former compensation or base future compensation on an individual's compensation history, you can always ask them about their salary or pay expectations, asking, what do you expect to make in this role? That's permitted 100% of the time. And like I mentioned at the top of this, uh, of this call, while salary history bans were trending for a couple of years, they've largely been replaced by pay transparency laws. But we do have one new addition to our list, and that is Columbus, Ohio, which joins Cincinnati and Toledo, also in Ohio, in prohibiting employers from asking applicants about their salary history or relying on salary history for compensation decisions. The law applies to employers with 15 or more employees in Columbus. As we wrap our pay equity and transparency discussion, remember to assess your policies and procedures to comply with pay transparency laws. The share your salary movement is trending and with it pay transparency. So rethink how you post jobs. If you need to post minimum and maximum salaries for all positions, can you? And even if a jurisdiction hasn't passed a law that requires salary transparency, should you move forward with adopting a salary transparency process in advance of those particular laws? Again, they're, they're spreading. The same is true with salary history bans. Are you still asking candidates to disclose their former compensation? If so, why? Are you really using former compensation to set future pay? Just a quick side note, HiRight made the decision back in 2018 to eliminate salary verification as part of its standard service offering. If you're subject to Colorado's pay equity law, that means either you have a physical presence in Colorado or 15 or more remote employees in Colorado, you'll need to shore up your practices to incorporate their pre-history, I'm sorry, pre-hire salary transparency notice requirements and post-hire notice requirements to inform workers about the candidate that you selected for that particular role. And finally, remember to remove age-related inquiries as part of your initial employment application in Colorado. Again, might be something that you consider doing across the board. So that is our pay equity and transparency discussion. Please use the Q&A icon, a lot of information here to submit your questions. We'll cover those at the end of today's webinar. Moving on to a recap of issues concerning privacy and technology impacting employers that progressed in the second quarter. Starting with an overview of state privacy legislation, here's a quick read. Montana and Tennessee are new to our list as measures that have been signed into law. Those are the measures in red. Legislature, legislators in Delaware and Oregon in Aqua have also passed comprehensive privacy laws, but they're still awaiting their respective governor's signatures. The important takeaways are that each of these laws basically requires that individuals are notified concerning the collection, use, and retention of their data and given some control over their data. Now, here's the good news. Each law contains an exception for activities conducted in compliance with the FCRA, in compliance with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which means that background checks when conducted in compliance with the Fair Credit Reporting Act are out of scope. So again, any data collected for the purposes of processing the background check request is outside of scope of each of the state privacy laws that you see on the screen. 
and an update from California that many businesses may, may find helpful. A last minute decision from a California court pushed enforcement of the California Privacy Rights Act, the CPRA, uh, from July 1st to March 29th of 2024. The California Privacy Protection Agency, they were supposed to complete their rulemaking processes on July 1st, 2022, so a year ago. But they didn't do that until March 29, 2023, just a few months ago. In fact, it would have left companies with only three months or so to comply. So the California Chamber of Commerce filed suit to delay enforcement of the CPRA rules that were established on March 29th, and the Chamber won. So what does this mean for you as employers? Well, you have another nine months to comply with the CPRA's new regulations. Those are the rules that generally require that you incorporate data processing agreements and implement mechanisms for consumers to opt out of data collection but you still need to comply with the measures of the California Consumer Privacy Act or CCPA that were introduced before the CPRA amended them. So things like providing consumers with a notice when you collect their data, as well as updated privacy policies, you still need to comply with those now. Again, background check data collected and used in compliance with the Fair Credit Reporting Act is exempt from the CCPA and CPRA, but other data that your organization collects may be subject to the CCPA now and the CPRA's rules by next March. I, I realize we covered a lot of acronyms here, a lot of information here. So please let me know if you have any questions, again, using that Q&A icon. Moving from California to New York City, the city's artificial intelligence and hiring ordinance that impacts employers who use automated employment decision tools. These are tools that substantially help with making employment decisions. It became effective on July 5th, just a few weeks ago. New York City's law prohibits employers from using automated employment decision tools or AEDTs to screen candidates or employees unless a bias audit has been conducted prior to deploying the AEDT. The law requires that employers using AEDTs undergo an annual bias audit on the, AEDT, on the AEDT conducted by an independent auditor, and that information, that audit, needs to be published to the employer's website. There's also a notice requirement. Employers have to provide notice to the candidate 10 days prior to the use of an AEDT, an automated employment decision tool. Uh, so you're probably going to want to publish that notice on your talent website or maybe your company's overall website. A lot of information with respect to the city's AEDT law. I've included the city's full overview of the rules associated with this law in the resources section of this webinar. So please check them out and let me know if you have any questions about the New York City AEDT law, which became effective on July 5th. Now we're going to talk about what's going on at the national level. The EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, has issued guidance concerning the use of artificial intelligence and employment decisions and disparate impact. Just a level set, I'm often asked what constitutes AI in the employment context? What are, what are some examples? So think of tools that filter resumes or applications to identify specific candidates. Uh, think about virtual assistants or chatbots whose purpose is to narrow the candidate selection process. Also, online testing tools uh, like games or quizzes used to score candidates based on their personality or their cognitive skills, maybe to assess fit within your organization. All of those things, those are all examples of artificial intelligence that's in the wheelhouse of the EEOC's guidance. Okay, so focusing on this guidance, what's, what's disparate impact? Well, disparate impact occurs when an employer uses a process to make employment selections, like choosing a candidate for hire over another, or uses a test that on its face appears to be neutral, but actually adversely or negatively affects a disproportionate number of individuals based on a protected characteristic, uh, something like race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And what guidance does the EEOC have for us? Well, I've summarized it in that four bullet points at the bottom of the screen. First, they put us on notice that artificial intelligence, AI, or other tools that make or substantially facilitate employment decisions about whether to hire, to promote, or to terminate someone, all of those things are in scope and should be audited to ensure that they're not discriminatory, that they don't 
uh, discriminate against a certain group of individuals. And if it's possible that an AI tool or solution imparts a disparate impact that they're discriminatory, employers must establish that using that AI tool is, quote, job related and consistent with business necessity. And that there's no less discriminatory alternative that's equally effective as that AI tool. Second, employers who use third-party solutions, this is software or online tools, for example, to help make employment decisions using artificial intelligence, they are not shielded from liability if those third-party solutions end up disproportionately affecting someone in a protected class, like members of a particular race or sex, for example. Third, the four-fifth rule applies. So four-fifths is 80%, right? which can be a general benchmark for assessing disparate impact. So let's say that you use an AI tool as part of your candidate selection process. And you're looking at two groups of candidates. Let's say you're looking at men and women. Based on the four-fifths rule, there should not be more than a 20% variance on who gets selected from those two groups. So for example, if your AI tool selects 100% of men who apply, but only 70% of women who apply, there's, there's more than a 20% variance in that selection procedure. It's, it's 30%, right? This means that there could be evidence of a discriminatory hiring practice in play, which you want to assess. But the EEOC tells us that the four-fifths rule is only a rule of thumb. It's not proof positive that there's discrimination, but it's something worth evaluating. And finally, if you discover that your AI solution results in a disparate impact, then you need to stop using that solution or retool it so that it doesn't continue to result in a disparate impact, that it doesn't continue to be discriminatory. That is the EEOC's guidance. It's really, really good. I think it's worth a read. Uh, again, I've linked to it in the resources section of this webinar. Please get your questions in using the Q&A icon and take a look at the EEOC's guidance. Plugging along, it's time for my favorite part of the webinar. It's time for some audience participation. So today we're looking at an EEOC enforcement action. There is a brief fact pattern that's on the screen. Uh, to, to summarize it, there is a company that operates a job search website that's used primarily to source talent for tech jobs. And the customers uh, that use this job search website routinely posted ads that qualified the types of candidates that they wanted uh, to look for. They, they wanted to look for things like H-1B candidates only. So the EEOC believes that the customers of this job search website were val violating Title VII, were violating anti-discrimination laws by discouraging American workers, such as US citizens and lawful permanent residents from applying. So there's our fact pattern tech website, tech website customers, employers limit candidate selection to only H-1B candidates. EEOC says that that uh, excludes American candidates from applying. So here is our poll question. I'll give you a few seconds to get your answers in. Here's the question I'd like you to decide. Is the operator of the job search website responsible for the content of the customer's post? Does that job search website have some obligation to ensure that its customers aren't acting in a discriminatory manner? A few more seconds to get your answers in. Yes or no? All right. Here's the outcome. Wow, it looks like almost an even split. Um, so slight majority saying that uh, the, the tech website was obligated to review its customers uh, job posts to ensure that they were not discriminatory. Well, here is what uh, the outcome of the actual case was. The case was settled, and you'll see the quote on the, quote on the screen there from the EEOC. Uh, it's imperative that individuals have equal access to employment regardless of national origin. This settlement serves as a reminder that the provisions of Title VII, the anti-discrimination law, extend to employment agencies, putting you on notice there. So what's particularly interesting about this decision is that um, the EEOC is asking the website provider to scrape the job posts for keywords such as opt or H-1B or visa that appear in conjunction or near the words only or must uh, and identify or eliminate posts that limit candidate selection to non-US candidates. So guess how this website provider is gonna do this? Well. 
they're going to utilize artificial intelligence. They're going to utilize AI to scrape the job posts and eliminate those offending ads. The EEOC also required the website provider to revise its guidance to its customers so that they understand that certain discriminatory language that is exclusionary should be avoided in their ads. So there you have it, proof positive that the EEOC is holding firm on its mission to assess and mitigate discrimination in hiring and other employment decisions at the hands of artificial intelligence, despite artificial intelligence being used in the solution to this problem we just discussed. It's kind of funny, ironic, isn't it? Uh, the EEOC is, is saving the day. I'm sorry, artificial intelligence is saving the day here. So let's, uh, let's recap. As we navigate the compliance roadmap, FCRA regulated background check data is exempt from the scope of state data privacy laws. So you don't need to concern yourself with for, uh, you don't need to concern yourself with, for example, a data protection agreement with your background check vendor for that data. However, if you operate in California, you will need to assess your ability to comply with that state's privacy law as it relates to other employee data. For example, the personally identifiable data that you collect as part of the application or interview process. Additionally, you'll want to ensure that you're transparent or con concerning your use of artificial intelligence. For example, when using AI solutions that automatically filter out resumes, and if you operate in New York City, assess your use of automated employment decision tools to comply with the law. Again, that was enforced as of July 5th. And as we just saw, know that the EEOC has AI enforcement on the horizon. They produce two pieces of guidance worth checking them out. Again, let me know if you have any questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So let's talk about the crowd favorite cannabis reform. You're going to hear me use the terms cannabis and marijuana and THC interchangeably in this section. Again, cannabis, marijuana, THC, they're all the same thing. Please do not let that confuse you. And here is our medical cannabis map, which I've revised to hopefully make a little more clear. Looking at your screen, you'll see states in red where accommodation is likely not required, states in aqua where anti-discrimination measures are in place and where reasonable accommodation of medical marijuana is required, states in blue where the law is silent on the issue of medical marijuana accommodation, and then Philadelphia, shown in that purple or wine color, which is banned pre-employment marijuana testing. Pennsylvania has a medical marijuana law, and in Philadelphia, marijuana testing is banned for most positions. So just a reminder to ensure that you are not testing most workers in Philly for marijuana. The remaining states in gray have not passed a medical cannabis law. When I talk about cannabis accommodation, I mean that in certain states, you can't discriminate against an individual just because they are a lawful cannabis user. And of course, the need to accommodate not only differs by state, but also by role. For example, there are typically, but not always ex uh, exceptions to accommodation for individuals in certain safety sensitive positions. And there are always exceptions for those in DOT regulated positions. So important to review a particular jurisdiction's law to understand any exemptions that may apply. You may have noticed that new to our map is Kentucky, which passed a medical marijuana law earlier this year. Kentucky's law does not require that employers permit or otherwise accommodate its use. So you can test your marijuana and you can adversely impact the employment of anyone who tests positive based on current state law. You can also prohibit a registered user of medical marijuana from performing in safety sensitive rules. And you can contractually prohibit vendors who support you. You can prohibit those vendors from assigning workers to you who use medical marijuana. So a lot of protections for employers in the sense of Kentucky's law. Kentucky's law will become effective by January 1st, 2024, after implementing rules are established. Moving on, here is our recreational map, which I've also revised for clarity. I hope, I hope you find these helpful. So as you can see on the screen, there are 23 states and DC, so 24 jurisdictions in total, that have legalized recreational cannabis, also known as adult use legalization. You might see that being used much more popularly now. Recreational cannabis, adult use legalization, same thing. While locations in red have no impact on employers, those jurisdictions shown in aqua, blue, or purple are different. Those jurisdictions shown in aqua allow for pre-employment testing for cannabis. 
but the statute stated that an employer cannot impact employment due to a positive test for THC. And next year in California and Washington, shown in blue, you will not be able to conduct pre-employment tests for the non-psychoactive THC metabolites. I'll, I'll expand on that in a minute. And in New York State and in Minnesota, Minnesota's new here, pre-employment testing for cannabis is prohibited unless an exception applies. So please make sure that you've aligned your drug testing panels accordingly. This isn't something that is automatically done for you. It requires your directions and some of your positions may be exempt from the prohibition on testing. Again, let us know if you need any help with this when you complete the survey at the end of today's webinar. So let's run through upcoming new or amended recreational marijuana laws. Again, I'm gonna focus on highlights that may drive drug screening program changes for you. That's what's important. Starting in July of 2024, California employers will be prohibited from discriminating against workers who use marijuana while off duty and off premises. And it's gonna protect, uh, prohibit employers from adversely affecting the employment of a worker who tests positive for the non-psychoactive metabolites of marijuana. So psychoactive metabolites, psychoactive metabolites, those are the metabolites that make somebody feel high Whereas non-psychoactive metabolites, those non-psychoactive metabolites, they, they don't in indicate impairment. They don't indicate that somebody is currently high, only that cannabis was recently used. The law does not impact an employer's ability to deny marijuana users who are in certain safety sensitive or other federally regulated jobs. So how do you test for psychoactive THC metabolites? I asked our chief medical officer, Dr. Todd Simo, and Dr. Simo recommends oral fluid as a screening option. So consider that as you modify your policies and procedures to comply with California's law. To the extent you want to continue testing for marijuana, you might have to move over to oral fluid. Looking at Delaware, Delaware's recreational marijuana law became effective in the second quarter. And while it offers no protections for recreational users, the state also permits the medical use of marijuana, and it requires that employers reasonably accommodate medical marijuana use. So if you get drug test results that are positive for marijuana in Delaware, you're going to need to understand if the individual with the positive result is a recreational or a medical user of marijuana, and then act accordingly with respect to your adjudication decision. In Maryland, adults are able to lawfully use recreational marijuana now. As in Delaware, mer medical marijuana is already legal in the state. However, neither Maryland's medical nor recreational marijuana laws provide any employment protections for its users. Again, no protections for either medical or recreational marijuana for users in Maryland. So no real impact to you as employers. Washington state, like California, has also banned testing for non-psychoactive cannabis metabolites. So again, you'll need to reassess marijuana testing in Washington. And if you find it necessary to continue testing for marijuana, then you might consider oral fluid as an option, or you can simply remove marijuana from your drug testing panel. And we'll wrap our discussion with a review of Washington, D.C.'s Cannabis Employment Protections Amendment Act. Employers cannot adversely impact a person's employment based on their use of medical marijuana or the presence of any marijuana metabolites. So that's any metabolites that's recreational or medical in any drug test without, quote, additional factors indicating impairment. So again, really broad protections for all users of marijuana. And while you don't need to remove THC from your drug testing panels, again, you can't affect an individual who tests positive unless they're impaired, so you might choose to do so. So let's look at our actionable guidance summary. I'll leave by saying that in this day and age, it's impractical, impractical to, to maintain zero tolerance drug policies. Instead, employers really need to focus on cannabis use and impairment at work and ensure that policies are amended to reflect that position. Impairment is really key. It's also really important to adjust your policies and practices so that if a drug test is positive for marijuana, you understand whether the individual is a medical user or a recreational user. In some cases, you might have to accommodate the medical use of marijuana, but not the recreational use of marijuana. And in some jurisdictions like New York uh, and Minnesota, you must accommodate all marijuana use, period. 
Finally, remember to revise your drug testing panels to exclude marijuana where required for most jobs. And by 2024 in California and Washington state, exclude testing for non-psychoactive marijuana metabolites. Again, this isn't something that your drug screening provider is going to do for you because they don't know if a candidate that you're considering may work in a position where marijuana testing or affecting the employment of someone who tests positive is permitted. Again, this is your responsibility. So please let us know if you need help adjusting your drug testing panels when you complete the survey at the end of today's webinar. And to re reiterate, any jurisdiction that has passed a law legalizing marijuana, either for medical or recreational use, any of those jurisdictions, they always exempt DOT regulated positions, positions serving a federal contract or subject to federal funding, and in many cases, safety sensitive positions as defined by that jurisdiction statute. That is everything that I have on cannabis. As always, I hope that I've helped to clear the haze. And if not, get your questions in using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Now let's quickly cover two important updates concerning I-9 and E-Verify. Shortly after the COVID-19 pandemic was announced, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, permitted employers to inspect a worker's employment authorization, authorization documents, something like their passport or their green card, virtually using a video call. So you could call up your worker on FaceTime or Teams or Zoom, for example, and virtually inspect their green card, passport, ID, et cetera. Now, employers were supposed to note COVID-19 in the additional details field of section two of the form. But DHS made it clear to us that this virtual flexibility, this flexibility for virtual inspection, it would only last for as long as employers were fully remote. And it was expected that employers would physically inspect employment authorization documents and correct any I-9s that were completed using this virtual inspection process once the employer returned to normal oper operations. Well. DHS has announced that it is ending the virtual inspection process effective July 31st, just a couple of weeks. All I-9s that were virtually inspected must be corrected by August 30th. So you're gonna need to physically inspect any employment authorization documents that were virtually inspected. You have to call those employees in to virtually, to physically inspect their documents. You're gonna have to correct all of those I-9s, section two of all of those impacted I-9s, uh, with the date that you physically inspected the documents, again, by August 31st. Now you can still use a third party agent to remotely physically inspect the documents, but the bottom line is that those documents must be physically inspected and the I-9s must be corrected by August 30th. Uh, for what it's worth, HiRight offers a remote I-9 process. So if you're concerned about correcting the backlog of I-9s that you completed virtually during the pandemic, our remote I-9 process could be of some assistance to you. So when you complete the survey, please let us know if you have an interest in learning more about the remote I-9 process or any of our I-9 services, and we're happy to get in touch with you. I should also mention that this only impacts uh, I-9s of employees that are still under your employee. So you'll have to understand if these individuals are still employed by you to the extent that they are, and you use that virtual inspection process, then you're gonna have to correct all of those I-9s for existing employees by August 30th of this year. And an update for employers in Florida. If you employ at least 25 employees and are hiring someone in Florida, you'll need to use E-Verify in addition to the I-9 process. This is the state's response to curb work done by individuals who are ineligible to work in the United States. While this law became effective on July 1st, penalties will not commence until next year in 2024. So again, you'll have to use E-Verify in Florida if you have more than 25 employees. If you need any information on high rights E-Verify services, we're happy to get you that information. Let us know when you complete the survey at the end of this webinar. So let's recap. You can continue to use the virtual I-9 completion process through July 31st, but you must physically inspect and correct all I-9s by the end of August. You can use a third party like HiRight to assist with the remote verification process. 
And if you employ 25 or more workers and hire anyone in Florida, you should be using E-Verify. If you're not set up with E-Verify, you should register and begin using it immediately. Penalties accrue next year. Again, we've linked to several resources in this webinar, so you might want to take a look at that resources section in this webinar, bookmark those, or copy and paste them into an email for future references. A lot of good information for you to, to consider there. All right, here is a quick plug as you get in your questions for our Q&A session. We have several outlets of information for you to consume. So if something piqued your interest, check out our resources library, our blog, and our Forbes articles to learn more. A lot of great information out there for you. And as always, there's a lot of information in Compliance Central as well for Higher Right customers. That's exclusive for Higher Right customers. All right, so let me get through some of your questions. So a lot of questions, and I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize these um, out of out of time and brevity. A lot of questions about um, the impact of clean slate laws, um, in particular Connecticut. Uh, it seems that a lot of you picked up on the fact that I mentioned that Connecticut uh, was supposed to have automatically expunged several uh, types of criminal offenses earlier this year, but has not done so. As of this point, only cannabis-related offenses have been expunged. So what does that mean for you as employers? Well, ultimately, it's unfortunately something you're going to have to discuss with your legal counsel. But like I mentioned, from a background check perspective, we can only exclude those uh, criminal records that are that are not appearing for us. Uh, so if, if those court records have been expunged or are not available in the court's indexes, then we can't find those. If we can't find them, we can't report them to you. The thing about clean slate laws is that an individual has to meet a certain set of con conditions in order to be eligible for that clean slate law. So it's simply impractical for uh, an organization to really know if an individual is or is not eligible for that uh, automatic expungement or um, sealing of a particular uh, criminal offense, especially in Connecticut. So again, unfortunately for many ex-offenders in Connecticut, those crimes which would normally be eligible for expungement will continue to be reported. And um, you're going to have to, as employers, figure out how you're going to assess those. But again, um, it's, it's really difficult to know whether or not an individual would have been eligible for the sealing or expungement of a law uh, based on any other criminal history that they may have. Questions also regarding the scope of Chicago's uh, ban the box law, their amended ban the box law. Uh, so again, Chicago's amended ban the box law applies to any employer who uh, requires a license to operate in the city. Most any employer would require a license to operate in the city, as well as employers who have offices or facilities in the, in the uh, city of Chicago. Uh, and again, the changes for your program are that it requires an individualized assessment. You have to include that individualized assessment as part of the pre-adverse action process. You also have to wait at least five days before proceeding to an adverse action. Um, as part of the adverse action process, you have to include that individualized assessment again. You have to notify the candidate of their right to file a complaint with the Chicago Commission on Human Relations. And you also have to notify the candidate of their uh, of any mechanisms to dispute uh, the findings, your decision with you. Uh, again, uh, if you're a higher right customer, we have made a sample template available for your consideration uh, within the pre-adverse and adverse action packets that we house in Compliance Central. Uh, again, you would need to use Compliance Workbench or comply uh, with those requirements outside of our platform for any of these bespoke, these jurisdictions that require specifically tailored pre-adverse and adverse action notices. Um, a lot of questions regarding drug testing, and in particular, the laws that are upcoming in California and Washington State. Again, they require that you remove the non-psychoactive properties of marijuana from your drug testing panels, um, so or, or from, from, from considering those non-psychoactive properties of marijuana. So you can do one of two things. You can either simply remove marijuana from your panels, or to the extent that you still find it necessary to test for THC, then you need to look for an alternative that does not identify those those non-psychoactive properties. Um, oral fluid could be an option for you. Again, this is uh, at the recommendation um, of our, our chief medical officer. So a lot of questions out there, a lot of questions in particular about this I-9 issue. Again, you'll need to correct all of those virtually inspected I-9s by August 30th. Not a lot of time to comply, but you can use a remote process. High right does offer remote processes. 
Um, so, so we're really about out of time here. Uh, you can expect this webinar to be posted to the Higher Right Resource Library. You can also expect to receive an email with your SHRM and HRC, uh, HRCI credits within a few days. With that, as always, I'd like to thank you for your time today. It really means a lot that you shared a portion of your day with me. So please take 60 seconds to complete the webinar survey. I base all of my webinars off of your feedback. I really take it seriously, so please let me know how I'm doing. And with that, we'll chat again in the fall. So again, thank you for spending time, a portion of your time today. We'll meet again next quarter. And until then, stay cool out there. Thanks, everyone.